And we are live. And there's no one here. Well, no one comes in. No, they're, they're going to come in. There might be a little delay on the uh, on the other side here. That's Let me okay. I want to have a drink of water first. Anyway. <sighs> the doors are opening at the bar. Yes. Dan and Sagey are letting everyone in. Everyone's scrambling for seats. Yes. Right. Yeah. And I'm taking pictures. You're taking pictures. I'm going up to the bar to get my rye. How long have you guys been at the KGB bar? How, has that always been the official? Spot? It's always been there. I mean, the so, series. Well, actually, there was a, a nonfiction one. The kind of really tight start of every, anything like this kind of started as a nonfiction thing run by um, Mark Jacobson. Hi, there's Gay Terry is here. Hi, Gay. Hello, Gay. Anyway, um, this and it was in this beauty parlor in, in like 30-something street. And we went upstairs, and there was this spot for like this little tiny venue where there was a nonfiction reading. And I think that's where the, the idea started. And then um, Mike Jacobson and Terry uh, Terry Bisson started. I don't know how they they got into the KG bar. I mean, they must have contacted Dennis Wojciech. The, uh, here come people. Hi, hi, David. Hi, whoever Dream Master is. Um, they must have talked to Dennis, the owner, and started doing it. I don't know what year that was. I don't remember. But I did go to the one, the nonfiction thing that was in this hair salon. <laughs> yeah, we're, um, we can never quite figure out exactly what year the actual KGB bar one started. Um, originally, I think I asked Alice Turner, the late Alice Turner, and she said late 90s, but then someone else said it was early 2000s. So it's been going, you know. I mean, we have a record. I was looking at our record because um, Lori, um, Dennis's girlfriend, was asking for some of the most prominent names because uh, I forget what some, I forget who, but some magazine might do an article about them. And um, she was asking for names. So I was looking from the earliest, what we had on our website, which was, I think, like 2000 or something. Hmm. Was uh, yeah, yeah, I can tell you right now. Uh, yeah, I mean, I went all the way back and I just saw some of the people who yeah. we, had done, we had there. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, Carol. I think, Carol, I think you're one of the people who defended me for, from on Twitter today. <laughs> oh, yeah, it goes, it goes back way back. Hi, Amy. Yeah, 2000, yeah. Uh-huh, yeah. But I, but I don't know. But was that when Terry and I was doing, when Alice and Terry were doing it? Too? I I wasn't attending um, until maybe two thousand four or five, so I, I don't know. So where did you get that list from? Ga Gavin, basically, I took the oh. website from Gavin. Oh, okay. So is this the twentieth anniversary of the KGB readings then? Well, we don't know the official start. This year, they, anyway. So it, it could be technically, yeah, this could be the twentieth anniversary year. Sure, why not? Let's have a party. <laughs> um, Hi, Nancy. So, yeah, um, hope everyone is staying healthy out there. So, are, you, are you reading this, Michael? Where? Are you reading the private chat? A comment. On the comments on the right. Someone says you look adorable. <laughs> so is it bits of Hades. Do you know who that is? Oh, uh, they say that about every reader. Yeah, yeah. right. Well, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> they never well, say that about anyone. Not, not. I mean, maybe they privately, but never. Say that. <laughs> and I love the whoever the lamb is. Very nice sheep. Right. <laughs> Oh, right. Yeah, Amy, I, yeah, I used to go to Nurse. Of, Amy, Amy I says it's great at Nurse. Of, I don't think it was going that early. It might have been going that early, but not with us. It might have been um, Terry and Mark Jacobson. Well, there is Suzanne Dottino, and she does the, the there's like a Sunday fiction work, uh, reading there. How, well, there are, oh. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of different oh, readings. People are doing the horns for the Workers, I can't open my window, so I can't do it. Oh Somebody yeah, that's a flaw. The worker, what the hell that's called? Um, but I they, can't open my window, so I can't do anything. <laughs> they don't do that in my neighborhood, and and for some reason, can you hear it? One of the hardest hit. Let's uh, hear. No, I don't hear it. Don't no. hear it. 
No. Is the la oh, and someone just honked. Yeah, no, there's this big mm -hmm. horn, like a that that big uvula, whatever the thing that stupid thing's called. Hi, everybody. Here are people. We are living in the end times. I hope not. Yeah, I hope not. Hi, Karen. Oh, the Mitch and Tom show. Who? Mitch is your son, Karen, right? Who's Tom? <laughs> anyway. Signed in on a weird account. Well, we've all done Mitch that. And Tom show. Hi, Luke. Oh. The gang's all yeah, here. Maybe, right, right, but it's possible. Oh, it is. Okay. It's right outside my window and uh, Alan in the in far west village right near the meat market. Amy, I yeah, I don't think KGB was going when I was going to nurse up because I would have known about it. So, yeah, I'm not sure when it started. Hmm. Hi, Devin. Hi, Daniel. Hi, everybody. Hi, Lizanne. Hi, Lizanne. <laughs> well, now so I have it. a person in the building that I think have a police car in their apartment. I hope not. Oh, that's oh, your that's neighbor? That's not outside? No, not me. That's John Off Odin who says that. No, no. That's, I oh, heard it sound. Oh, so, so, how do you pronounce that? Lucas saying. Vuvuzela. Isn't that the. Vuvuzela. Uh, South American horn. Like, they play at soccer games. It sounds like someone was blowing. Yeah. Vuvuzela. I didn't know how to pronounce it, and I still am not sure, but okay. <laughs> Hi, Chris. Welcome. Hi, Chris. I'm oh, glad you could with join us. Oh, cool. Okay. You know, uh, Patrick and Niels and Theresa Nielsen Hayden used to live near the Greenwood Cemetery down the block. And actually, I took a tour there. Um, I guess it was the, I don't remember if it was the Horace tour or what kind of tour. The famous, some famous person tour. It was great. Oh, there's hollering of fireworks in Harlem. Yep. <laughs> it may not be for the it's not for the reading the fireworks anyway <laughs> they're not lighting it for for us they're not lighting it for michael no, no unfortunately uh, Actually, Mike. Right. No, okay vuvuzela okay vuvuzela okay that's how you pronounce it thank you matt i'll never remember them but anyway that's where it sounds like someone was playing oh so your wife was a tour guide there cool uh, Vuvuzela. Vuvuzela. Okay. Uh, everyone should have a drink. <laughs> and by the way, if you are having a drink, if you would have a drink, this is Sherry, Leverly Sherry. If you would have had a drink at KGB, I hope we hope that you will donate the drink money to the bar for the bar itself and for the um, for our bartenders, Dan. Says yes. I have a ticker for that. There you go. There um, yeah, they have a Fundly page, so um, they're asking to um, donate directly there. So it's a really yeah. long URL, so I shorten it. it. That will help. Yeah. Hi, Forrest. All right. Is anybody going to be uh, watching the Stoker Awards next weekend? I will be. You're you're up for an award. Congratulations! That's well, awesome. yeah, yeah, and we all videoed an acceptance in advance. Oh, wow! No. Nice. I don't even remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But no one will see it if I lose, so it doesn't matter. Linda Addison says, hang on, going for my white wine. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Who is Dream Master? Hi, Dream Master, whoever you are. He's having some, they're having a drink too. Hi, Carrie. Cheers, everyone. Cheers, Dream Master. <laughs> I think I said this before. Who is Dream Master? Sorry. I, but I have a nice sour IPA from Evil Twin, Granola Mom's favorite. But is it a can? Yes, yeah, it comes in a can. Beer, is it any good in a can from a can? Oh, yeah. Yeah, why not? I don't know. It sounds like it, would feel, it seems like it would be tinny, like tastes like an aluminum. I don't no. think so. I mean, well, I mean, you know. I'm drinking this way too fast. <laughs> like, Sherry, I'm going to be drunk by the time we start. All right. <laughs> All right. Carol, I'm do you have the sidelines? Linda has to watch. She's up for it too. She's getting her wine, so she's not on right now. All right. 
So we have 33 viewers right now. Hello, everybody. Wow. That's like cool. capacity at the KGB. Very nice. Yeah, I mean, we've had it pretty crowded there, but 33 is a pretty good crowd. 33 is not that crowded at KGB. I mean, it's not packed anyway. Yeah. yeah. Amy says cans are all fancy. Hi, Teresa. How are you? Hi, Teresa. Teresa, the evil twin is great, and they deliver. I agree, oh, Teresa. Teresa. <laughs> Wait, they deliver, Teresa? I thought you have to go pick it up. Hi, Morpheus. Okay. I think I've met Morpheus, at least online. I probably should take an allergy pill. I'll be right. Well, I'll, I'll be right back. <laughs> Hi, Farah. She's watching from the other room. Oh, hello, Farah. <laughs> David says, someone saved me a seat. It's crowded in here. I don't David. know. David, first come, first serve. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Hey, it's Liz is here. Hello, Liz. I got a seat. I got a seat right next to me. I saved it for you. Very nice. You got plenty of room hey, here. Who's that? Liz Garinsky. Hi, Liz. Mm, that's the doll cut. Yeah, so we're Liz, I, Liz, like I'm sorry. Time. I enjoyed your tweets about your um the guy at the record store. I'm sorry that I feel lost. Hmm. He sounds like he was a good guy. Yeah. Who are you talking to, Dream Master? <laughs> well, <laughs> us. I just finished watching Fleabag. I watched Fleabag second season last night. It was great. It was fabulous. Oh, yeah? Oh. We just watched the first two episodes of For All Mankind. What's that? It was that? really good. It's, um, it's a show on Apple TV that um, it's an alternate history where the Russians land on the moon first. Oh, so it, okay. it energizes the American space race in a different uh -huh. way. And they actually have real characters from history, like, uh, you know, Deke Slate and Neil Armstrong, um, Werner von Braun. Mm -hmm. It's actually really well done, really well well produced. Yeah, I was gonna do a whole rewatch of James Bond, but got bored after the first two. But I'll probably skip around. I'll go back to it. I mean, it's just I don't want to do them all in order. I'm not gonna watch all of them again. I'll yeah. just do them every once in a while. <clears throat> but I, I haven't seen some of the recent ones. Black, I'm getting my DVD. I got my DVD, so I'll finish that soon. Oh yeah, Fleabag is is terrific. Yeah. The tunnel, Gay says on season three. I have no idea what that, that is. Oh, that must be related to the bridge, the one the Scandinavian one. That's I think oh, the remake. Bridge of the and bridge. tunnel. Yeah, the bridge one was is like it. It connects um, I, Norway and Denmark, I think, or. One of the two Scandinavian cities, and it, uh, it's a crime thing, and it's being adapted here. It's oh, okay. Crime, I think instead. I can get dark. Says he I, recommends I, dark. I, I, I have um, Net, I have Amazon Prime, <clears throat> and I'm able to get some things free on that. So I'm just picking things like that. Okay. And I can't remember. I don't. I don't remember if dark was on there or not. Linda says she loved for all mankind. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, we're only two episodes in, so we're we're loving it. So I don't far. want to watch my episode. I have to watch the whole thing. I mean, I don't real. I don't want to watch things week by week. I, I gave up on that kind of TV watching in high school. Oh, yeah. I went for college and never turned on the TV again. Oh, we liked we well, liked I binge. Vice. I did like Miami Vice. <laughs> All right. So should we get started? It's about oh. seven ten. Oh, Gay. Okay. Wait a minute. Well, hold on, Gay. So is it the same as the bridge? I mean, do you know if it's related to that? Is it, well, uh, she said her, the one that she's watching is Paris and London. So I wonder, is it a crime series? <clears throat> the answer. Paris and London. Yeah, I don't know if it's the same, if it's a remake of the series from Scandinavia. Okay, well, anyway, we can start, I guess. Sure. Okay, uh, I guess I will then get started. Um, first off, welcome, everybody, to our... Um, second uh, live stream ever. Um, tonight's guests are authors Michael Sisko and Clay McLeod Chapman. Uh, so this, if this is your uh, first time tuning in to the, um, the, the show, or if you've never been to the uh, Fantastic Fiction Readings, uh, Fantastic Fiction at KGB is a monthly speculative fiction reading series held on the third Wednesday of every month uh, at the famous KGB bar in Manhattan, uh, hosted by 
myself and Ellen Datlow. Um, Terry Bisson and Alice K. Turner started the uh, fantastic fiction reading series in the, in the late 90s. Well, that's what our bio says. We were wondering that before. Attempting to bring together mainstream writers with writers of spec fic in order to show, in Alice Turner's words, that at a certain level, they were plowing exactly the same field. In the spring of 2000, editor Ellen Datlow took over for Alice Turner, and in August 2002, Gavin J. Grant, publisher of Small Beer Press, stepped in for Terry Bisson when he moved to California. Author Matt Kressel, that's me, stepped in for Gavin in April of 2008. Uh, have a mail list. Well, first they, had, they were doing it when they moved to Massachusetts, or he was. Right. Yeah, they were commuting from, uh, I don't know if they were in Northampton at the time, but it was, they were it was a long time. It was a long drive for them, so they, they, uh, they needed to step down. But um, we have a mailing list. Uh, if you go to kgbfantasticfiction.org, and let me see if I can get a banner up here so you guys can see that. Um, here we go. Oh, it's up already. Yeah. Um, fantasticfiction.org, click on mailing list and you can subscribe to our low frequency uh, email, which we just have uh, um, announcements about our upcoming readings. Um, the KGB bar itself is a Soviet themed bar on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, 85 East 4th Street. Uh, it used to serve as a speakeasy style meeting place for Ukrainian socialists during the MacArthur period and before that. Um, before the... Um, the coronavirus uh, quarantine and shutdown of New York City, the bar was host to uh, many literary events most nights of the month. Um, um, and, and in fact, New York Times called it uh, one of the best literary venues in New York City. Uh, in 20 years of hosting the fantastic fiction, the KGB bar never once charged a cover. Uh, we usually ask on location that the audience buy a drink hard or soft to support the bar, but since they're closed, we are asking our viewers to support the bar by sending payments to them through Fundly, if you can. So let me see if I get the link up here for you guys to see. Here we go. You want to just, you know, the amount for a drink and a tip. Yeah, if you want to just send them like five bucks or ten bucks, like whatever you would spend for a drink at the bar, even if maybe you're not in New York City, but you you want to support the the bar and keep them going. I mean, they really are. A, a great venue, and they've been they've hosted an enormous number of reading series and, and authors and poets and, and other artists over the years. So we really want to keep them alive. If you can do that, that would be great. Um, oh, and then owner Dennis Wojcik promises that he he will give a percentage of tips to the bartenders. Um, this is our as I said earlier, this is our second live stream ever. Um, it's hard to believe we've been sheltering for more than a month. Um, things have been tough for many people here in New York, um, and we are all grateful that we're still able to share these readings, readings with you all. And uh, we're grateful to our authors that they can be here tonight. Um, so uh, last month, Ellen and I decided that we would cancel the... In oh, go ahead. You want to say something? Wrote, if someone gets a chance, could you throw the bit.ly link in the stream description so it's clickable? Can you do that? I can. I will do it after the reading because it's okay. it's kind of hard to do while while it's locked. But I will definitely do that. Thank you, Carol. Um, yes, thank you for reminding reminding oh, us. Carol saying something else, but Carol's um gonna donate. She said she might donate what she would spend on train fare. Oh, thank you. Um, so as I as I was saying, we decided to cancel the in person reading for the safety of everyone involved, and then eventually the city shut down, and and we we wouldn't have been able to do it even if we wanted to. Uh, so rather than disappoint our guests and our regular audience, we thought it would be a good idea to do the live stream readings over the internet, uh, you know, from the safety of our own homes. Uh, it worked so well last month that we decided to do it again. So grab a drink, hard or soft, and join us for some fantastic fiction. Uh, before we introduce our first reader, I uh, just want to tell you quickly about our upcoming guests. Uh, obviously, this is up in the air because... Uh, we don't know what the future will bring. Uh, if the KGB bar remains closed and the guests are open to it, we obviously would continue to do live streams like this one. Uh, so next month, May 20th, we have Liana Renee Heber and Alana C. Myers. June 17th, N.K. Jemison and Kenneth Schneier. July 15th, Mike Allen and our favorite guest, TBA. 
Uh, August 19th, Michael Liebling. September 16th, Livia Llewellyn and Craig L. Gidney. October 21st, Laird Barron and a possible special guest that I can't announce yet. Uh, November 18th, Kat Rambo and Benjamin Rosenbaum with a question mark because he's not sure if he can make it uh, then. Uh, I hope you will stick around at the end of the readings because we will have a uh, Q&A with the readers. So we'll ask them some questions and then we'll open it up to questions uh, from the live stream. So uh, you can ask questions like uh, people are doing through the live chat. So uh, enough about me. Uh, the first reader, and let me just get our banners ready here. Let's go play. And then let me turn this one off. There we go. All right. So our first reader is going to be Clay McLeod Chapman. Clay McLeod Chapman is the author of The Remaking, Nothing Untoward, Commencement, and several other novels. He has written the films The Boy, Henley, and Late Bloomer. In the world of comics, he is the writer for Marvel's ongoing series, Scream, Curse of Carnage, as well as Iron Fist, Phantom Limb, Lazaretto, Self Storage, Edge of Spider-Verse, and American Vampire, among others. For more information, check out his website at claymcleodchapman.com. Here's Clay. Hey, guys. Uh Thanks for having me. This is super awesome. Um, I'm going to actually read uh, from my most recent book called The Remaking. And it is a ghost story told four different ways every 20 years. Um, part one is actually takes place around a campfire uh, in 1950s, early 1950s. So I figured let's Let's have a little campfire storytelling tonight. Um, here we go. These woods whisper. The pines at your back. You can practically feel the needles bristling in the wind. Lean in and listen closely and you'll hear their stories. Everything that's ever happened underneath that vast canopy of conifers, every last romantic tryst, the suicides, the lynching, you name it. And these trees will testify to them. These woods have witnessed them all. Whenever somebody from town wants to do something in secret, they'll, they'll come out here where they think they're alone, where nobody's watching. They'll hide in the shadows, you know, performing their, their little rituals beneath these branches as if they believe these trees are keeping their secrets for them. They, they think nobody's listening in, but that's, that's not true. That's not true at all. The, the trees are listening, always listening. The woods know what the people of Pilots Creek have done, what we've all done. I've lived in this godforsaken town my whole goddamn life. I know just about everything there is to know about the people here. Do you know how? <laughs> I listen. I listen to the trees. I listen to the woods. So, what story do you want to hear, huh? You want to know what it was that dragged Hallie Tompkins to hang herself back in 46? Or which men it was who strung Russell Parr up? Or how about that baby they found half buried back in 38? Hmm? No. You're not here for any of those stories, are you? You want to hear about Jessica, don't you? Of course you do. Tonight, of all nights, 20 years ago on this very evening, October 16th, 1931, we don't have much time. I mean, here it is, almost midnight, and I haven't even begun to tell the tale of the little witch girl of Pilot's Creek. Poor, poor Jessica. You brought me a bottle? No, 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 don't be stingy on me now. That is my price of admission. You want to hear a story? You goddamn well better have brought me an offering. You know, alms for the minstrel. Something to, something to wet my whistle so that I'll sing. Because Jessica's story takes time, takes the life 
right out of me. Her story takes its toll on the teller, you hear? That, that price is too high. Unless you, unless you got a little something to, to drink, huh? I, uh, I don't think I'd be able to get through it without a little drop of that lightning bolt. I'll, I'll sound like a bullfrog before I'm finished. Did you? Did you, did you bring me something? Just to, just to take the edge off, you know, warm my inside? Oh, thank you. Thank you kindly. That is, a, that is much better. If you feel that fire work its way down my throat, settle into my belly like a bonfire. Now, where were we? Oh, yes. Let's start with Jessica's mother. Hmm? Ella Louise Ford was born back in 1912, right here in Pilots Creek. Now, she'd come from good stuff. Her family owned their fair share of you know, acreage growing tobacco or something, but, but there was always something off about that girl. You know, her mother sensed it from the get-go. None, uh, none of that sugar and spice and everything nice for Ella Louise. No, that girl was touched. Little Ella talked to possums. Hmm? She made charms out of dried tobacco leaves. She kept honeybees inside mason jars and hid them underneath her bed. She couldn't be bothered with those uh, frilly dresses or the dolls like all the other girls her age. Not the, not the porcelain kind, at least, with the, the pigtails and the rose-painted cheeks. No, no, no. Ella Louise made her own dolls. You could even call them dolls. They looked more like, like totems, like effigies, twined together with twigs and wheat, moss and leaves, little, little insects buried in their chests, little, little beetle hearts, huh? <laughs> Try as they might, Mr. and Mrs. Ford could not break Ella Louise out of her strangeness streak. She never mingled with any of the other children her age. None of them trusted her. You know, all the other boys and girls sensed something was off about her and they kept their distance. You know, Mother Ford took this all too personally as if their rejection of Ella Louise were an affront on the family name. As you gotta understand now, back then, a town as small as Pilots Creek was just crippled with superstitions. Words hold power around these parts. And well, once word got around about Ella Louise's peculiar habits, it wasn't long before business for the Fords began to take a turn. <laughs> it only grew worse. The older Ella Louise grew and she became a young woman. Hmm? And nobody wanted to be associated with the Fords, be seen fraternizing with her family. Anyone who did suffered just as much of a cold shoulder as they did. Because you gotta understand, all anyone had around these parts was their reputation. I mean, simply to be seen in the midst of the Fords was enough to, to bankrupt businesses, ruin entire legacies. You couldn't wash the stink of that family off once it clung to your skin. No, that family was cursed. Mother Ford took to punishing her only daughter. Hmm? Bend Ella Louise over her knee and try spanking the darkness out of her. You know, taking a switch to the insides of her thighs until the insides of her legs. But anything that might, you know, exercise this witchery brewing within her. There it was. That word at long last, witch. You got whispered amongst all the other mothers, their children, all through town, in church even. It wasn't long before that gossip grew into a downright din, until uh, it was unavoidable now, until everybody was talking about it. Ella Louise Ford was a witch. Her debutante ball was a downright disaster. You know, Mother Ford had moved heaven and earth to make it a night to remember, and, and in a way, it was. I mean, <laughs> it truly was. Just maybe not the way that Mrs. Ford had hoped for, huh? See, 
Ella Louise had always been a sight to behold. She looked as if she'd stepped right out of a, an oil paint, some, something you might see hanging up in a museum, huh? Her skin was pale, always pale, the slightest bit of pink illuminating each cheek. She always had this grin playing across her face, but you'd never say that she was smiling. No, 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 no. Her lips just curled heavenward all on their own. And her eyes, they ever locked onto yours were this, this deep green, as green as the deep sea, I reckon, to the depths of which no man has ever ventured or, or ever will. Hmm? What mysteries lie beneath those murky eyes? Well, only the devil knows. Coming out to polite society had always been a way of Pilot Creek's upper crust. Mother Ford had done it, and her mother had done it, and her mother, and on and on and on. So you goddamn well better believe that Ella Louise was going to have her turn no matter how much she protested. <laughs> mother Ford simply would not hear it. She refused to let the ritual go. For, for a girl to become a woman, she needed to be pre presented, to be unveiled. I mean, that was just their God-given rite of passage. Ella Louise was meant to wear this beautiful ballroom gown stitched just for her pink silk. Oh, Mother Ford could barely hide her high hopes for her daughter when she handed that dress over. Even then, she was holding on to this fantasy that Ella Louise would be welcomed in the polite society. But at the moment of her coming out, at the very moment when every debutante is presented to Pilot Creek's upper echelon, Ella Louise stepped out onto the dance floor covered in mud from head to toe. <laughs> her gown was in tatters, all that pink ripped to shreds, dried leaves tangled up in her hair. You could see her body moving beneath that ripped fabric, her pale flesh exposed to just about everyone. I mean, practically the whole town was staring at her. Nobody moved. Nobody even breathed. Ella Louise stood before them all, that grin playing across her face as if nothing were off about this at all. She asked her father for her first dance as a young woman, just as her mother had instructed her to do. Huh? Now, Mother Ford nearly fainted right there on the dance floor. Huh? <laughs> Ella Louise was cut off from that night on. She was uh, excommunicated from her own family, disinherited. Her mother never uttered her daughter's name ever again, her own flesh and blood. It was as if, Ella Louise never even existed. She, she never set foot in her own home ever again. So, she made these woods her home. Now, it ain't exactly clear if, if she built her house herself or if someone had a hand in helping her, but a, but a cabin manifested itself seemingly out of the blue. Now, these woods are primarily comprised of eastern white pines. They reach up to 100 feet easily. So much lush coverage. It's perfect for building a simple one-story cottage with a fireplace cobbled together out of stone and mortar. Where you could see the glow of a fire through its window at night if you happen to be out there, but nothing or no one called these woods home. Not another living soul. Just Ella Louise. and Jessica. Now, if I were better at my arithmetic, I might surmise it was the night of Ella Louise's coming out that also served as the moment of her daughter's conception. I mean, whatever happened out there in those woods to bring Ella Louise back in such a muddied state, well, nine months later. <laughs> but then again, I am, I'm no mathematician, and I sure as hell ain't no baby doctor. Nobody knows who Jessica's father was, or more to the point, nobody owned up to it. I mean, would you? Back then, a town as small as Pilots Creek? Oh, no, you might as well have said you'd laid down with the leper. No, Ella Louise was our town's burden to bear. Pilot Creek's own pariah, weeks, 
Months would go by and nobody would see her rummaging about town or, or hear her voice begging for pocket change or even think about her living out here all alone. But then the sound of a baby crying lifted up from these trees. Oh, Jessica's wailing filled this forest. It echoed all the way into town, into the ears and dreams of just about every last townsperson. Ella Louise had herself a daughter now. Other theories of paternity abounded, such as Jessica had no father. She was immaculately conceived by the devil himself. Hmm? Ella Louise had made her pact with the Lord of Flies and he begot her an only child. Her, her, her very existence was a morbid reminder of her mother's unholy union with Beelzebub. <laughs> Ella Louise and, and her daughter Jessica would come into town for their groceries, just, just like everybody else. I mean, you can't, you can't live off of root vegetables alone now, can you? But when folks laid eyes on that little girl in her mama's arms, well, all they saw was the princess of darkness. Huh? We would only see Jessica whenever she would come into town. We watched her grow in these fits and spurts. Weeks, months would go by and oh, hey, there she'd be. You know, braving down the lane next to her mama, always holding her mother's hand, always keeping her eyes down to the road. She didn't attend school like the rest of us, didn't learn about life like the rest of us. I, you know, whatever lessons she got came out there in her cabin. I, I can only imagine what she was taught out there in those woods, the, the devil's arithmetic. It wasn't until Jessica turned nine that she started coming into town on her own. She always had this list of goods to fetch for her mama. Without Ella Louise beside her anymore, well, a few of us boys felt a bit more emboldened by our inherited distaste for Jessica. Kids took to throwing stones at her, calling her all kinds of names. I, I am not proud to admit that I myself fetched a pebble or two in my day, huh? And I threw one, tossing them right at Jessica's back <laughs> once. I struck her in the shoulder. My aim was true. Jessica turned to me. Even though I was amongst a dozen other boys, all of them holding their own stones, she knew that I had been the one to throw it, that that rock had come from my very hand. She pinched her eyes at me and without even saying a word my way, I, I swear, I heard Jessica's voice in my head as if, as if my own thoughts were suddenly boiling over in my skull. She whispered at me, cursed me. What'd she say? Uh, I'll never tell, unless you got another bottle on you. Suffice it to say, her curse worked. I can't stop thinking about her. Not back then, not even now. She left, a, she left an imprint of herself, a shadow on me. Little Jessica never left. Nobody, nobody ever mentions how beautiful she was. Her, her mother may have been a, a picture of perfection, such a lovely face, but, but, but Jessica? Jessica took my breath away. She, she was an angel. And yet, for the life of me, I, 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 I can't remember the color of her eyes, or I, I, I can't remember the color of her hair or the features on her face. I can't, I can't remember any of her words escape me. She returns to me night after night for over 20 years now, and yet the moment I wake up, the, the vision of her dissipates, gone. Just like that, I can only see her in my dreams. 
As a boy, I was frightened of her, what, what she might do to me, but, that, but I couldn't stop myself from welcoming her into my head night after night, into my sleep, into my dreams. Now, now I wait for her, yearning for her to return. Why won't she let me go? If Ella Louise had been touched by magical, well, then her daughter was downright blessed. Jessica had twice the talent her mother had. Talent, well, what else the hell are you gonna call it, you know? Ella Louise nurtured her daughter's talents, taught her everything she knew. If, if Mother Ford had tried her damnest to, to, to stamp out the fire brewing within her daughter, well then Ella Louise went ahead and just fanned those flames. It was said that Jessica could commune with wildlife she could mend a bird's broken wing with just the touch of her hands. Weeds would wilt from under her touch. Just a, just a simple tap of her finger against the soil and out sprouted a toadstool, a, a dozen mushrooms. That's what we believe. What folks whispered amongst themselves around town. None of us saw this with our own eyes, but we didn't need to because we believed. Any boy brave enough or, or dumb enough to set foot into this forest and sneak a peek through their window, they got a pink eye for their troubles. Anyone who came close to their home would suddenly break out in a rash, their skin suddenly scorched in poison ivy. Anyone who said an ill word about Ella Louise or Jessica within her earshot would suddenly discover an eruption of blisters over their tongue. None of this was simply by coincidence. None, none of this was by chance. We all knew what Jessica was, what her mother was. We all knew what those two were up to out there in the woods. I'm going to stop there, guys. Thank you very much. That was awesome. That was awesome. Wow. So I think that book is available all over the place. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to put. I'll put up a link when we do the Q and A. Okay. Um, you can also check the bio on the uh, on the YouTube page, mm -hmm. but. Uh, Ellen, you want to do the outro? We'll oh, sure. So um, we're going to take a break for about five minutes, I guess. Right, Matt? Yeah, five, minutes. Yeah, five sounds Go good. To room, go to the powder room, have a drink, do whatever you want, check your email, and we'll see you back at uh, about a quarter of. All right. Sounds good.
Yeah. Matt, do you have the questions for Clay? What's that? Do you have Clay's questions? Yeah, I have the I have the Q and A. Yep. Okay, because Michael never gave us one. Yes, he did. He sent it to me. <laughs> well, he didn't send it to me. Sorry. Um, I, I put was it, replying to Matt. That's yes. I put them all in a uh, a Google Doc that I can send uh, send you. But I'll I could ask them, Michael. Unless you want to ask them. No, it's all right. If you want to do it, you can do it. I'm sorry, Ellen. I just was responding to, to yes. Matt. You heard Ellen's feelings. <laughs> I'm driving her to drink. <laughs> you scared me to drink. All right. Are we live right now or not yet? Should we? Um, I'm sorry. What'd you say, Michael? Are we live right now or not yet? Oh yeah, no, we've been live. We have not okay. been unlive. Okay. Um, well, I'm right. technically always unlive in effect. But when someone is reading, you don't see everyone else, do you? Right. No, I just I see. Know. I just saw Clay. You you see what's in that square? So right, good. Um, okay, that's good. <laughs> all right. So Ellen, uh, you want to? Okay. Hello. Are we on? You are on. Yes. Hello there, everybody. Welcome back to Fantastic Fiction at KGB. It's great to see you all again. And our second reader is Michael Sisko, who has published 10 novels, including The Divinity Student, The Great Lover, The Narrator, Animal Money, and Own Language, plus a short story collection called Secret Hours. His short fiction has appeared in the Thackeray T. Lamb's Head, Pocket Guide to Eccentric and Discredited Diseases, Lovecraft Unbound, Black Wings, Blood and Other Cravings, The Weird, The Grim, Grim Scribes Puppets, and Aikman's Heirs, among other anthologies. He teaches at CUNY Hostos. Please welcome Michael Sisko. Hello, everyone. Um, so I want to thank Ellen and Matt and KGB for having me. I should talk into the mic, shouldn't I? Um, and also for Clay for that wonderful reading. Um, and thank you all for coming or uh, tuning in anyway. Um, so today I'm going to be reading excerpts from a novella called Do You Mind If We Dance With Your Legs? First of all, Ellen, is this okay vocal sound level wise? Am I loud enough? You sound okay. good to me, Michael. Okay. I have, the, I have everyone else muted, but you're good. Right. Okay. So yeah, this is a book that was supposed to come out la at the end of last month, but then a virus intervened, uh, but it should be coming out soon. It's one of the charitable chapbook series that's being put out by Nightscape Press. And so one third of the proceedings go to the Los Angeles LGBT Center, which seemed like an appropriate charity given the subject matter. Um, I'd like to dedicate this performance to my late friend, uh, Robert Parker, who passed on Monday. Uh, I'll be jumping around a bit, but I'm starting at the beginning, so I'm not going to give you any introduction. So this is uh, called, Do You Mind If We Dance With Your Legs? Let me start my timer. Sorry, this is way less professional. Sorry, there you go. Um, here we go. Pedrito Marinetti decides to find Irene Trigg at first sight of the flyer on the lamppost. He takes the flyer down, carefully stripping back the tape. He studies the paper for a few minutes, then puts it away in his vinyl handbag and goes to retrieve his bicycle. He takes the hill road home, barely aware of the steep grades that make the trip arduous, buoyed up with a kind of serene expectation concerning the task ahead. He has to concentrate on the road in order to ride safely, but his mind is already turning over the question of how to begin the search. When he crests the hill at last, his sustained effort at pedaling floats him up, then tips him down in a cascade of effortless speed, as if all his mass had been translated into breeze. Fragrant wind blows off the pines in the sagebrush and lifts the ends of his blonde wig up like a cape around his head. A joyous rush of vividness comes with it. He looks out over the lights of Los Angeles downtown rising like a luminous scepter far off in the distance and its arteries patched with orange lamps and streaming with glowing blobs it is a vast and beautiful abstraction that is what he likes best about it he pulls into the driveway of his parents house in a wide arc 
swinging the bike into the garage, left open for him despite his repeated warnings about keeping coyotes out. No lights on in the house. Pedrito lives with his parents, and they have never seen him dressed as a woman. The sight would only frighten them, and they would jump to conclusions. Women are pure, Pedrito always thinks. He wears women's clothes to be more pure himself, more dignified, and perhaps also to mislead the bad fate that dogs him. He slips off his shoes and enters through the kitchen, padding across it by the light from appliance clocks. Moving silently, it takes him a full five minutes to get to his room. He shuts the door very slowly and then relaxes. He changes into a plain undershirt and shorts, fills a glass with water and takes it with him to his desk. There he lights a few candles and unfurls the flyer. Missing. Irene Trigg. White face, white eyes, white teeth, fair hair. The candles throw his reflection in gold and orange onto the window panes. Pedrito's room is like a cell thrusting out into the void, a converted upper deck with windows floor to ceiling on three sides, the dark hillside below, the shining city beyond, a few blanched stars above. The shiny, uh, and the pale ribbons of highway between. He sits down to work. Headlights and taillights stream from his forehead, and logical possibilities float up like phosphorescent lozenges of headlights and taillights and helicopter lights trailing through the imperfect dark. Skipping ahead a bit. Back to the chart. At the bottom of the sheet, marked number one, were the words, Irene Trigg, missing. Laddered lines spread up the page as Pedrito maps out all the logical possibilities attending on or proceeding from the fact of Irene Trigg's disappearance, spilling onto other sheets as needed. One of the first possibilities is dead, with an X through it. The X means that there's no point in considering the possibility of her death. If she is dead, he will not find her alive, and there's no reason to search for her dead. If he rules out her death on the chart, then her actual death is likewise ruled out. Setting down a phrase like sexual slavery, he is alarmed to think that perhaps he is somehow reminding reality that sexual slavery is an option. He has also X'd out the lines leading to whatever doesn't imply jeopardy. If she's only eloped or something, it stands to reason she can't be rescued. He doesn't want to find out whatever happened to Irene Trigg, but only to determine if the particular scenario he has in mind concerning her is the actual one. Irene Trigg's NAM US file says she has no history of runaway. Left eye color, blue. Right eye color, blue. Eye description. Very pretty eyes. The police will have already checked the morgues and hospitals and will follow the obvious leads. They don't have too much of a head start on him, he doesn't think, but he will take it for granted that they will reach Irene Trigg before he does if she can be found by assuming a common scenario. As a rank outsider, with a discomforting personality, unlikely to win the trust of strangers, he can only hope to find Irene Trigg if there's something bizarre about her disappearance. It's nighttime when Pedrito is finished with his destiny chart. He studies it in a map of the city, spread out on the table in front of him, trying, by electric lights and candles, to visualize shapes in the landscape and to hold on at the same time to the fatal outlines thornily clawing their way up the chart. He keeps peering out the window with his eyes closed, seeing the felty shadow hills and the scattered treasure of the city lights and over it a smoky elastic bank of darkness that rolls and bulges and parts as it crawls over the ground, opening to reveal now this neighborhood, now that, conducted by Pedrito like an orchestra from his high perch. 
any area where there's overlap of chart and map will likely be significant to the case. Eagle Rock, Spar Heights, Linda Vista, where you can see Linda, Atwater, where the water's at, Elysian Valley, Echo Park, Park, Park. Skipping ahead now a bit. The next day, Pedrito starts in Spar Heights, rolling methodically up and down every street, going into stores to buy cigarettes and mints and to show people his flyer. Hey, fag, from a passing car. After ten days of this, he shifts to Eagle Rock. He stops at a copy store run by a stoic Vietnamese woman called Dee Dee, his mother knows from parent-teacher night. Pedrito finds Dee Dee sitting motionless behind the counter at the very back of the store, sandwiched between, between the register and steel shelves filled with empty boxes. She comes alive the moment she sees him, smiling and asking him how he is, how's his mother, rubbing her lower back with a little spasm of pain as they talk. I really should come round sometime, she says. How long has it been, Pedrito? I'm not certain. Sometime around two years and eight months. Two years and eight months? That's too long. Pedrito shows her the flyer. Have you seen this before? Well, sure. Those, those flyers were made here. They were. Do you remember who made them? Well, he had... Gray hair, I remember that. Have you found her? Have you called the number? I haven't called the number. There were no tabs left. I would like to call the number. I am going to find her. Really? That's exciting. I want to reunite her with her family. Really? That's very nice of you, Pedrito. That's a very nice thing to do for someone. People should help each other, don't you think? Yes, I, I agree completely. Can you help me find them? There are no trigs in the phone book or online. I'm afraid I have no information to give you about them, Pedrito. That's unfortunate. That's a setback for me. Can I see the poster again, Pedrito? Oh, yeah. I saw her. I saw her the other day. She came out of a coffee shop up on Colorado, and I just knew she looked familiar. Which coffee shop was this, please? I forget the name, but it's just up there in Colorado. It's the only one. Was anyone with her at the time? Please. I'm sorry, I don't... I'll, I'll, I'll go investigate. Thank you very much. Well, you're welcome, Pedrito. Anytime. Good luck. Dee Dee is dialing her phone as Pedrito leaves. So Pedrito goes to the coffee shop. He sees a couple of undercover cops. Uh, he notices they're watching a building across the street. Uh, he sees them pursue a man who's left the building, but instead of following them, he notices that there's some activity in an upstairs window. Someone was watching them go. He doesn't see the person, but he does see a hand at the window holding the drape, and it doesn't. there's something wrong with that hand. It's like a puppet's hand. So he decides to investigate. The fifth floor corridor is empty. There's just a smear of light on the waxed floor from the window at the end. There's a damp smell he doesn't associate with the clean desert decay of Los Angeles, and the only sound is a television booming somewhere deep within the walls. Cautiously, a voice says. Cautiously. You don't understand. Right. He must be cautious because he doesn't understand. Not yet. Pedrito slips off his low heels and pads over to the door at the end of the hall. He listens. His heart is pounding. He keeps glancing over his shoulder. 20904. 20904. He pulls the wrench and pick from his purse, kneels before the door, and rakes the lock without breathing. The lock clicks, and he is inside faster than he is ready to be, the wrench falling from his hand and twanging against the floor, the sound startling him, so he drops the pick, too. It chimes. The apartment smells like a sick room. The air, the walls, all seem to vibrate with a lingering numbness. 
the Dorito intuits at once that whoever owned that hand he saw at the window cleared out the instant the detectives had gone after the decoy, the frail man. Pedrito checks the view from the window, sees the street below, and a car pulling out. The occupant of the room? The hand he sees for a second, just a second, on top of the steering wheel, is the same one that pinched the drape, like he's doing now. He's sure of it. They've switched places. The hand is like old ivory or wax, not like flesh. No use pursuing that. Pedrito notes down the license number and searches the apartment, projecting a search grid. Thoroughness is tiring. Pedrito feels himself starting to get sleepy after a while. He wants to open a window and clear out this sickish, brain-dulling air. The beds are all made, closets empty, nothing in the kitchen, nothing anywhere. He could lie down to sleep on the floor if it weren't for this rotten air. He would catch something, wake up so ill he couldn't move, and waste away on the floor, too weak to call for help. Then, with a thrill, Pedrito extracts an earring from a crevice between the wall and the kitchen linoleum, a silver sun with a laughing face, the same earring Irene Trigg is wearing in the poster. 20904. 20904. I'm jumping way ahead now to an encounter he has with her somewhat later on in the book. It doesn't go um, as one might expect. This street will take him toward the ridge. He moves all the way over to the right to stay well clear of the man ambling along with him, passes very near a parked car with an open window, a little girl's brown face, black hair, framed for a second, and the strong peppermint smell of her breath wafts over his face. He continues down the block, dissociated. The late afternoon sky with its clouds, the neatly kept homes with their bright flower beds, the people he passes, are all in another world. It's like seeing everything on the river bank from a raft on the river. Right there, and another world. He studies every house as it goes by, not sure what he's looking for, not quite remembering, not really slowing his pace. So he's surprised when a woman, Irene Trigg, brushes by him. Her hand touches his bare forearm, deliberately touches, and Pedrito is instantly overcome with a sensation of falling. It isn't exactly dizziness, but something worse, a terrifying, deep and rapid discrepancy opens between his standing here in broad daylight and the feeling that he is hurtling downward through airless, lightless space, faster and faster, into bottomless darkness with no wind. He catches his breath and jerks away clumsily, stumbling, and this brings him closer to actually falling. The sensation disappears as he breaks contact. He staggers, foot over foot, leans against a tree to get his bearings back, and looks up in time to see a leer of mockery vanishing from Irene Trigg's face. Everything all right, she asks, and disappears behind a tall hedge. He can't summon up his voice, and he has no answer to give. Collect yourself. Be careful. Be careful. No sign of her. Stick to the plan. Don't be confused. Pedrito continues up the street toward the ridge, his bicycle. Hey, faggot. Dead voices. A perfunctory, almost coerced shout at him from a passing car. The shadow that tall building is casting is much too large, raying outwards from all the angles of the house. It lies across his lane, back to the bicycle. He forces himself to enter the shadow, and the bright pavement on its far side lifts and is carried away from him like a leaf floated by the wind. A soft pressure 
like a filling sandbag collects in his abdomen and starts forcing the air up and out of his lungs. Aren't I pure? Her voice asks from somewhere nearby. You're not pure, he answers. Purely impure. The voice is ominously droll. All women are pure, she says. Pedrito loses control of his imagination and sees, or is shown, on all sides a neighborhood of empty alleyways and empty rooms with people in them, motionless, lifeless, bizarrely heavy, unpeople, gathering solidity and stillness and dire realness. Isn't this your stillness, Pedrito? This is a very carefully selected shaft, especially envenomed bolt. You don't understand, a voice says. I prefer not to be touched, Pedrito says. He's watching from outside as his body walks up to a wide, faux Chinese sort of ranch house with a second story protruding up from behind. The front door is nearly five feet wide, with a knob set into a broad brass bowl, and it swings open as he steps into the gloom of the porch. A massive arch of polished steel stands in the middle of the living room. The area rug beneath it is only lightly compressed by it. The arch frames the couch and the television on the far side of the sick room of the room, and sick room air oozes through it. Crossing the arch, Pedrito unwittingly holds his breath. Did a cloud slightly dim the sun? He's on the other side. He stands in front of the couch, the television, seeing himself reflected darkly in the screen, and the view from inside the arch behind him, reflected in the screen, induces panic, part of himself fleetingly wanting to leap back to a safe moment ago and undo that step across, back to his bicycle. Pedrito realizes everything is different. It only all looks the same. It looks the same, but it feels like the worst, the worst possible place to be, with nightmarish dread squeezing out of apparently relaxed furniture. And there's thumping, a regular thud, thud of feet walking back and forth on the floor overhead, back and forth. Before he knows what he's doing, he's coming out of that horrible room and into this banal one, and it's like leaving a hospital bed for a bright morning. But in that brief interval he spent on the other side, he heard footsteps thudding upstairs. Now he can't hear them. You don't understand. The center lane isn't the bicycle lane. Pedrito tries again. Again, the nightmare closes around him. Icy lucidity tells him how totally caught by this nightmare he will be if he leaves the arch. His heart races. He looks all around himself like an animal in the instant before the predator gets it, pounding footsteps just above his head. An ordinary living room. Again, he throws himself out, the nightmare springing back so that even in retreat it is frightfully alive and vigorous, quick to respond, missing nothing. This time he tells himself he will stay. He came to rescue Irene Trigg. She needs him. She's in there. He plants his feet on the other side, bracing them against their own frenzied impulse to leave. Nightmare, dread, footfalls, drum overhead. He pads up to the second floor. The door to the upstairs bedroom at the end of the hall is open and haloed, dim, grainy, a crime scene photograph. Irene Trigg is pacing up and down in that room, flashing back and forth within the door. There's thick shag carpeting on the floor, gossamer curtains that catch and hold back the gelid light of this congealed, clabbered, dead day. Someone in the bed, Pedrito is just in time. Irene is disappearing through another door far off to his right. The room beyond that door is in almost total darkness. Curtains outlined by day spill along the walls. Her perfume 
her shape crossing, her silhouetted hand held out to him. You have my earring. He fumbles in his purse, finds it by touch and places it in the frigid palm. Her fingers brush his skin and the falling sensation overcomes him so quickly he shouts with alarm in the dark. Her grim laughter mingling with his cry, the sound of another door opening and shutting. No touching! He shouts. Pedrito reels into an upstairs hallway adorned with Chinese bric-a-brac and Irene vanishing through a door 50 paces away. Her silk scarf is lying exactly midway between them, and Pedrito takes it as he goes after her, tying it around his own neck the way she was wearing it. Through the door, just in time to see the last of her going through another door, her feet bare, her shoes side by side, halfway between them. They fit. He stuffs his own pair into his purse. Pedrito is just in time to see her slip behind a broad, mirrored doorway, and then a very narrow, closet-like doorway. This layout is impossible. The center lane isn't the bicycle lane. Pedrito stops blindly pursuing Irene. The right thing to do is to go back. Pedrito shuts his eyes and remembers. He places all the various articles of Irene's clothing back as he goes, not stopping until he sees his own footprints pressed into the white shag of the bedroom floor. Something darts in the corner of his eye, but his fixed gaze will not be tricked, and seeks out instead the bedroom corner where Irene Trigg stands motionless, covered in dust, hidden by a wicker screen, the earring he found restored to her. There's a thud behind him, the figure on the bed, coming down on both feet. The heavy comforter is thrown over him, and he's grabbed in a chokehold from behind, stifled by the blanket. His throat is scissored shut. Thank you very much. That was great. Yes, that was very good. So when will it be coming out now? It's hard to tell because um, we're waiting on the printer. Um, and then I have to sign them and then they go back to be distributed. But right. if they are available, they are available for pre-order. And if you do pre-order them, they will send you an ebook version of it mm -hmm. uh, first. So you'll have that right away. And then when the hard copy is ready, then you get it. Yeah, that's the deal. So that's okay. Nightscape Press that's doing it. That sounds good. OK. Awesome. And it has beautiful illustrations. It's it's an it's a nicely put together book, and it's definitely worth getting. So, mm. and and remember, one third of the proceeds go to a charity of. Who did the illustrations? Um, I'm sorry. Who who made the did the illustrations? Oh God! Now you got me on the spot. Hold on, I can get to that information, but it's going to take me two shakes. Hold on, <laughs> um, because the pre the cover was by one artist, and the uh, the interior art is by another. So Luke Spooner did the interior art. And the cover art is by Don Noble. Okay. Very nice. Good. Do we want to take a break before we have some Q and A's? I think we could just go right to the Q. I have questions too. If you have, can can the readers see the questions from the live comments? Can yeah, they uh, I'll I'll read them. I have a, a few prepared questions for for um, right. our readers tonight, and then and then we can uh, open it up to the the audience. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, Jack. Yeah, so let's uh, let's start with, uh, with Clay here. Let me let me put you up on the on the big screen and put you on the spot. Uh, Clay, um, is is there a true story behind uh, the little witch girl of Pilots Creek, also known as Pilots Knob, Kentucky? Uh, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is. Um, I <clears throat> there is a I, I changed it for the novel to Pilots Creek, Virginia, um, but there is a story that takes place in uh, Pilots Knob, Kentucky, uh, about the little the, the little witch girl of Pilots Knob, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a true story that if you go there right now, you can find a uh, there was a, a young girl uh, several decades back who, uh, along with her mother, were burned at the stake. Um, because they were believed to be witches. And uh, they buried the body of the mother out there in the woods in an unmarked grave. Nobody knows where she is. But uh, they were, th these kind of, these townsfolk 
uh, very religiously minded, uh, were very uh, scared of the little girl, more scared of her than her mother. So rather than kind of disposing of her body in the woods with her mother, they uh, actually buried her in a steel reinforced coffin, okay. and consecrated ground and a church graveyard uh, under six feet of concrete that they poured over her, then a bed of gravel, and then around her grave, there is a fence of uh, interconnecting crosses. Wow. And you can actually, you can go there right now. Uh, that grave is there. Um, mm -hmm. And it is a, the, the kind of the, the mythology of that uh, particular grave has kind of embedded itself into the local culture. Uh, it's an, an urban legend of the little witch girl of Pilot's Nam. And I kind of found that story and it, it, it kind of spawned this, this idea uh, for the remaking. Mm -hmm. cool. um, so you have, um multiple fictional films in the novel. Um, were there any real life films uh, that inspired them? Um, I, I am a huge fan of this film. I, I'm gonna get it wrong. It was either 1971 or 74. There's a film called uh, Let's Scare Jessica to Death. Yes. Um, it, is a, it is a personal fave. Um, and I, <laughs> I essentially wrote, uh, you know, there's a, essentially with the remaking the novel, there's this whole idea of like, what starts off as a ghost story in 1950s turns into a kind of schlocky drive-in 70s, you know, celluloid saturated, uh, low budget horror film. Mm -hmm. And then uh, 20 years later, it gets remade into a Scream style, uh, you know, film. And then 20 years later, it becomes a true crime podcast. But uh, for the, the 70s component, that, that section of the novel, I, I wrote it as if it were, um, let's scare Jessica to death. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the 90s, you know, of course, in the 90s, it becomes a uh, scream. Uh, but, you know, I, my, I have such a fondness for let's scare Jessica to death that it was just, it was me just writing kind of fan fiction for, for that. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us like a little bit about uh, how uh, the novel works with um, the oral tradition and, and stories we tell around the, the campfire? I, you know, that the whole first section takes place at a campfire and I, you know, it's fun for me to have an opportunity like this. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to, uh, you know, in essence, kind of bring the audience, bring the reader uh, in and around the campfire. And I, you know, I grew up down south. Yeah. Storytelling and the oral tradition has always been kind of the bedrock for for my, you know, childhood and and kind of creative. Uh, you know, my my artistic upbringing is is kind of it lives and dies around the campfire. So um, it, this having a chance to write this book. Like I knew it needed to have its kind of seed or its origin point as, as a ghost story. So, um, and it allows, you know, my inner ham a chance to come out. So it's the best of both worlds. Well, it was a great, it was a great storytelling. I, I indeed felt like I was sitting around the, the campfire with you with my, <laughs> my little, uh, on, on to Michael, um, uh, Michael, um, I'm curious uh, about the main character of, of your story. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you approached creating his psychology and gender identity? Yeah, but I mean, the, the main concern I had with with uh, this character was um, that it might be that he would be misunderstood as sort of trying to exemplify a label of some kind. And uh, I didn't do that at all. This character really came to me as himself um i don't know if it came through quite in the reading but you know he hears he kind of hears voices um he's estranged from other people but i didn't want people to get the idea that i was trying to write to a label or write to a category of person uh that you know he really came to me integral as a character like that and so 
uh, it wasn't an attempt to write, uh, you know, from any given identitarian point of view. It was really just he came to me this way, and he wanted he wanted to be that character, and so that's who he was. I love that. Um, so uh, proceeds from the sales of uh, your book go to support the Los Angeles LGBT Center. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that came about and why you chose to support them? Yeah, I mean, I chose the, I wanted an, a Los Angeles um, charity because the book is set in Los Angeles. That's where I'm from. Um, and I haven't written a lot of stuff set in Los Angeles, though. Um, this is, the, I think, the longest, most sustained piece I ever wrote set there. And so um, I want, I felt it was appropriate to give something back to the city by choosing a, a charity that was situated there. And given um, Pedrito's problems with harassment throughout the book, I, sort of, I guess I should have issued a trigger warning about, that, those, about certain words in the reading. So I, my apologies if I uh, forgot. But um, I don't know. I, th I, th I tried to find an, a charity that he would have approved of or that could have helped someone um, with his problems. And so that's how I ch chose the LA, LA, uh, Los Angeles LGBT Center. Um, they're a very worthy charity, so even if you don't buy the book, you can support them anyway. But buy the book, and then you do the book. Uh, can you can you tell us um, some about the supernatural aspects of the story? In particular, I'm, I'm wondering more about if you can talk more about the nature of the of the others, the fake people. Right. There's uh, Los Angeles is supposed to be full of fake people, so. <laughs> I actually made fake people. I mean, I've always loved sort of body snatchers, um, dreams of a mannequin, which is one of Ligotti's more haunting stories. Um, and I wanted to do something like that. And so the, um, but it also gelled with the way the main character sort of is alienated from other people for his own reasons. So it was, it just worked out really well. So I didn't have a sort of fixed lore for them or anything like that. I didn't have a legend to work on, um, but they're essentially like the body snatcher people, you know, the, the now there will be no more tears sorts of people. Um, the, the Not so much malignant as sort of balefully neutral. Uh, that's sort of what I was going for. <laughs> cool. Um, well, I, I thought both readings were fantastic. Um, so I'd like to uh, open it up now to, to questions from the audience. Um, so we're, we're operating on a, a little bit of delay from our, our recording and what people see on YouTube. It may take a minute before the questions start coming in, but hopefully you guys will, will ask some good questions. Oh. What happened? We just lost Michael. Michael, you who? Yeah. Well, we'll give him a minute to come back here, but uh, oh, there he goes. He's back. He's back. Something had to go wrong. It was I'm the designated guy to have something go wrong. So, yeah, well, so I'm back. Yeah. And the I'm sorry. We have to start over. Let's. Okay. Start. Sorry. Sorry, everybody. Sorry. So come on, people. Ask some questions in the peanut yeah. gallery here. Um, questions. You know, we'll wait for people to ask questions. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, with one for Clay. Actually, I thought your um, your performance was great. So, can you tell me a little bit. Like, have you worked on stage? Did you do? Do you do acting? Like, what's your background? You were asking in the comments. I thought you must be an actor. Yeah. Um, I mean, there was probably a hot minute uh, in college where I was aspiring to 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 perform, but uh, I, I I kind of made a decision that. Uh, writing, I, I wanted to tell my own stories. And, uh, you know, I, I think performances like this ends up ultimately being a kind of foot soldier for delivering the story to whomever is interested. So for me, uh, any any kind of uh, performative education, I, I went to North Carolina School of the Arts for one year. Uh, okay. And it was, uh, you know, acting conservatory, theater, uh, you live, breathe, eat, sleep, date, argue with theater. And uh, it took a year to realize that I was never going to cut it as an actor. So um, I uh, luckily, you know, had stories to fall back on. Matt, did you see the notes from Carol asking if you put links up to both books? 
Can you do that? Uh, yeah, I, I if you go to the uh, YouTube link, I think the link there's links to their. Uh, it may not be um, Michael's latest, but there there are links to their um, their books in the uh, YouTube description. Uh, but if we have uh, specific links you guys want to add to the, to that, I can absolutely do that. Okay. Um, any more questions? I'm not seeing them coming in. It might be a little delay. So, um, anything you guys want to talk about? Something. Um, from, from oh, here we go. Matt S. Oh, they're coming in now. Uh -huh. uh, can you post that? Yeah, Matt S. For Michael, fellow writer, teacher here. How do we keep a leash on the time you spend on teaching and on writing? Do you find you need to divide your brain between the two activities? If so, how? I don't know. I try my best. Generally, I don't write on the same days when I teach. And so um, but usually teaching takes all my energy. Um, so I divide it up that way. Um, the bigger problem hasn't been so much teaching as, as sort of academic writing versus literary writing, because they're two completely different styles of writing. And uh, it, that sort of hurt my brain for a long time. I, I've only just started to get used to it. I don't know that I have any really useful tips. Um, but then again, you know, so much of my experience in teaching uh, advises my writing too. You know, it's like I meet people and I, I encounter situations that, that I can later on use in something I'm writing. So it doesn't, it's not interference. It's just... Uh, Uh oh, something. I don't know how to answer it. I mean, it's like it's um, it doesn't interfere. It can it if you know what you're doing, it it doesn't interfere. It just amplifies. It it gives you more to work with. Matt, Linda has a question. Do you see it? Yes, I did. I'm going to put it up on screen. Question for Michael: Do you, your descriptions of characters, set and settings, are so poetic? How did you learn how to do that? Uh, I'm reading a lot mainly. Um, I guess one of the keys was, I mean, for me, like um, Clay was talking, if I can call you Clay, Mr. Chapman, uh, you know, was talking about the importance of oral literature and performance. And, you know, I, I, that was important for me too. L listening to things was always very important in addition to reading things. And very often when I'd listen to, say, an audio book of something, I'd often notice something about it that I didn't really catch reading it. And uh, for me, the rediscovering William S. Burroughs was a big deal because he could talk on the page. And that, more than formal poetry or anything like that, really got me thinking in terms of how you put the sound of the voice on the page. And beyond that, I don't know. It's just I, I loved a very, very elaborate, decadent, beautiful, scintillating writing that was a la lavish and descriptive uh, language. And I had to learn to actually rather prune that back because it had the tendency to metastasize and become the entire text. Um, but yeah, it's been a lifelong, it's a, just about finding your voice really. I mean, it's like if that, you find the voice that speaks the way you want to speak and it's going, you're, there's a very plain kind of poetry that you find in some, in some ostensibly non-poetic writing. And a lot of fanciful poetic looking writing is actually rather exhausting and tedious and sludgy so that it doesn't really get across the, the idea either. But there's, so it's just a balancing act. The main thing I could say is listen when you write and read it out loud and g let the sound tell you what, what it wants to do. Yeah, I agree with that. I, you know, I, I think reading your work aloud, I read my work aloud all the time. I, my neighbors must think I'm very strange. <laughs> Lynn's a poet, I'm sure she reads her work aloud. Yeah. Um, any other questions from the audience? More questions, people. Anybody? Send them in. Now's your chance. On anything you want to know. No. Three minutes. We'll see if anyone shows up. What is everyone reading right now? <laughs> what are you reading? I mean, what are you all reading? Who? I mean, I'm actually reading. Uh, the stories of Sholem Aleichem. He was a, um, a Yiddish writer of the um, late 19th, early 20th century. People called him the um, Mark Twain of Yiddish. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, lots of Eastern European shtetl stories, uh, <laughs> yeah. kind of witty and humorous. 
Yeah, I'm reading the um, biography of Shirley Jackson right now. Oh, uh, nice. Franklin. And I, I hardly ever read nonfiction, and I hardly ever, ever read biographies. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to see the bias of the biographer come through. Mm -hmm. but whether it's positive or negative, it's just like, you don't know that she actually thought that. This is your interpretation. Exactly. You know, yeah. and that's really intriguing to me. I'm only 100 pages in, but it's really interesting so far. Someone had a question, like Forrest, about Melville. Forrest, yeah. Forrest asks, do you still like Melville? said you studied Melville in grad school, Michael. Oh, yes. Yeah, of course. Always. Uh, you know, you're talking about the American oral tradition and, um, and you know, beautiful rhetoric. I mean, you don't get better than Melville, certainly. Um, so, yeah, of course. I mean, um, I haven't written as much critically about him as I'd like to, but then, you know, it's, it's a big yeah. undertaking and it's a crowded field. Jack, but no, I, I will love Melville. I will stand Melville. Till the day I die. <laughs> um, Robert asks, um, how difficult it is it to go from novels to comics? Also, the boy film was amazing, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching it. Um, I, you know, I, I, I feel as if, uh, you know, in terms of transitioning from, you know, one form of storytelling to the other, I... I, I believe that writing um, for comics and, and for film, to be honest, it's such a kind of immensely collaborative process that uh, I feel uh, the storytelling that I'm doing for a comic book is so foundational um, that it, it I, I kind of bow down to the illustrator or the director uh, where with fiction, it's such a internal, process uh i very rarely leave this room so uh, <laughs> you know, it, it is i think it's the difference between um where where the engagement with someone else comes in when i'm writing a novel it's mine for a lot lot longer um mm -hmm. where it's a comic book it's it's almost like uh it's almost like beat poetry you know you're you're, you're looking for a gesture or like action poetry or like jackson pollock you know, you want to create an, a verb or, you know, distill the image to such a degree that you can kind of translate that for an illustrator or an illustrator takes that to translate. And uh, Carol had a question. Have either of you done or considered doing, oh, here it is on here, doing your own audio recordings of your work? Doing your own audio recordings. I'm just going to reiterate the questions because we're also going to do an, um, an audio only version of this. So. Uh -huh. Um, I, you know, I was really lucky uh, for, um, I've done two audio books. One for my first book, which was a collection of short stories called Rest Area. That was like 2002, 2003. And then uh, the remaking, hold on one second. Um, the remaking had an audio book with recorded books and we had four different narrators uh, so I did part one, another narrator did part two, another narrator did part three, and another narrator did part four. So that that is out there as well. And I've done some readings of my own stuff and posted it mostly uh, amateur hour on YouTube. Um, the, I, there was a, a possibility at one point of doing an audio book for the narrator, um, but I really felt like I had to read it myself and uh, they wanted to use their own reader. Um, I do would I would like to do uh, longer term you know, like longer projects, especially because I would like my stuff to be available to people who, for whatever reason, are unable to read. Um, but uh, that's just a question of time and being able to get enough quiet in my apartment for uh, periods of time so that I don't have you know sirens and cats and who knows what going on all around me or clapping at seven o'clock, uh, interfering with the readings. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would love to do audio. Um, you know, formal audio recordings of my stuff. It's one of those things I've always tried to find time to do and failed generally to find time to do. Um, but yeah, I love reading my own work. And indeed, I've, I've read other people's stuff and posted that on YouTube as well, uh, me reading various other things too. Um, so that's my... I have a bit. personal request for animal money. If you're going to be doing an audio... Thanks, uh, thanks. That one Great. I would love to hear that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll be great. You know, that's that's an 800 pager, and if you don't know, so um, 
Yeah, we picked the long one. Nice. <laughs> You're trying to eliminate the competition, I see. No problem. Yeah, yeah. I got it. It's a marathon reading. Oh, my God. Twenty. I thought uh, I thought both readings were really great tonight. Um, unless another question comes in, we may call it. Um, do you guys have any uh, closing comments, uh, Clay? Why don't you uh, you want to plug anything, say anything before we we go? I mean, I would. I, I feel like please check out the remaking. It's a it's a book you know that I wrote as a total labor of love for books published it. Uh, there was, there's hopefully going to be another novel next year, it, you know, depending on where we are next year. So, um, you know, spring 2021, I've, I've been told. I don't know if you want to post uh, Chris McLaren. Yeah, I was going to say, we got one really good question that came in from uh, Chris McLaren. Um, both readings tonight had a very deep sense of place. Can the authors comment on what they thought was important about the setting and what they tried to do to capture the important aspects of place. Gotcha. Great question. Yeah, go for it, Michael. No, oh. no, I was I was waving to Chip. So I was like, sorry. Waving. Okay. Wait, which side? I'm, I'm reverse. So up there. It's like the braiding <laughs> arch, isn't it? Yeah, I know. Or Hollywood yeah. Squares. Yeah. Uh, go for it, Clay. I just feel well, like you need voice, like if. I, I feel like reading is such an intimate experience uh, where, you know, to, to, to pick up a book, I, I want the narrator to feel as if he, they are engaging very specifically to that one reader. So I, I think and always prefer uh, first person narrative over third or second. So I, I feel like first person at least permits a certain kind of sense of drawing the narrator or drawing the reader in and kind of making them engage a little bit more. Um, it's almost like asking the reader to meet the narrator halfway. Um, and I, I feel like there's a, a slight kind of interactive vibe to that. So, uh, you know, you, you ask about place and environment. I feel like it has to start with voice um, and everything else just kind of, kind of swells around it. Yeah, I think that that's really well put. Generally, I mean, I write a lot of a fair amount of fantasy, so I'm inventing the place. And so um, then, but in this case, we're, it's Los Angeles. And I guess I was interested in sort of thematizing the, the idea of fakeness, which is a lot of people's experience when they don't, when they weren't born there uh, versus, you know, my experience of the, of, of Los Angeles or the environs having a lot more to do with the people and the, the sort of, um, the essence of it. I don't know exactly what to, how to describe it, but that's what you're hunting for, right? It's that inexpressible thing that makes that place that place. And it's not something you you decide at the beginning and then go from. It's something you, you produce, uh, drawing on your own, the extent to which a place touched you. So you, you, you produce it out of that, not exactly memory, but about, you know, it's a part of you. So it speaks, you allow it to speak through you in a way. So when you think of a place like Los, when I think of a place like Los Angeles, I'm thinking of the landscape. I'm thinking of the light. I'm thinking of the of the sort of airiness of that place. The amount of air there is between people. When, when, like, when yes. did you leave Los Angeles? When did I what? Leave there. You said leave you there. Uh, I'm, I go back all the time because my folks are still there, but I haven't lived there really since 1989. Mm. I came out out here to uh, to go to school. I realize that's supposed to be out there, but this is out here to me. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I left to go to school and I, uh, for one reason or another, I remain more or less in New York indefinitely. So yeah, I've been away for quite a while. Right. All right. Uh, Michael, do you have any closing comments for us? Me oh, closing comments. Yeah. Wait, yeah. I, I can use my uh, my Jack the Jerk. Oh, I've been waiting all night to use it. Does, he would like me. does he Jack would... have any comments? He would bite. Jack would like. Would Jack like to answer any questions? No. no. He's purring right now, but that's he's untrustworthy. Ah, I <laughs> yeah. He's a jerk. He's yeah. a, he purring and he, he he wanted to bite me. Oh, well, yeah. on the subject of biting me, the uh, um, yeah, my my rec I, my closing comments would just be that. Uh, 
again, I would I hope you check out. Uh, do you mind if you if we dance with your legs again? It's it's for a good cause. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. I have a bunch of other things coming up. But again, as as I think Clay mentioned, it's kind of kind of hard to make plans at this point. But I wrote a whole yeah. passel of stories, and I'm trying to package they're, they're, and package them as like a collection of ten. 10 short stories that I'm trying to put out this year. So that may happen. So um, that's the, that would be something that's on the horizon as well. So, uh, you know, keep your eye on that. Yeah. And that's what yeah. I have to announce. And be and please, everybody, be well. Yes, yes. Everybody, everybody stay, stay safe. Stay safe. Uh, uh, so, yeah, thank yeah, you. Thank you, thank you, Michael. Thank, thank, you, Michael. Michael. Um, thank all of you uh, for uh, joining us online, people who are watching the live stream and people who watch this later on. Um, yes, awesome. And uh, just a reminder that um, Center for Bucks towards KGB Bar. Yeah, if you can, if you can support the KGB Bar, I'll throw up the link on the screen here, and I'll put it in the um, I put it in the YouTube description as well. If you uh, would like to support the KGB Bar during the uh, shutdown, uh, you can do so at this link. Um, great literary venue in New York City. So. Uh, Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks. And we will see you hopefully. Either in person or on here. Yeah, either in person or on here. Either way, mm -hmm. I hope to see you all. So everybody, have a good night and thank you. Thank, thank you. you.